Annette Collins and, and Bill uh, Woodring. I don't know if Bill's not here, right? Uh, no. Bill's not here uh, for, for having us and, and for uh, giving us the space for this meeting this morning. Um, you want to say a couple of words? Sure, just uh, I want to welcome all of you as usual. I'm sorry about my voice. Some of you know me, some of you don't know me. But of course, we're really happy to have you guys. Uh, with uh, I, my, my saying always is without the Brewers, there's no TAP New York. And we really appreciate you know the effort you put into coming here. And we hope we take care of you guys. And uh, we appreciate the New York State Brewers Association for pulling their end and helping out with this. And uh, enjoy it. It should be a good day today. And uh, you know, so again, we're happy to have you. And then more, more importantly, I want everybody to know that every year they donate money to the New York State Brewers Association, a dollar per ticket. Um, and, and a lot of people are unaware of that. And, and that's, a, that's a great thing. We, we greatly appreciate it. We're starting a little bit late. Um, I, I wanted just to give a, a quick, uh, let everybody know that my last count for breweries in New York State is 154. Um, I, I, uh, I'll introduce Bart here in a minute, who's with the BA. But um, we go back and forth. There, there are two breweries, as a matter of fact, that are here that I didn't even have on my list, um, which is really shocking to me. Uh, Galaxy, um, which I didn't have on my list uh, until I found out they won a World Beer Cup last week. Uh, there's another one called uh, Last Stop. So it's, it's evolving. It's, it's a big part of my job. I find a lot of breweries on Facebook and Twitter because that's usually where they start off first. Um, out of those 154, there are currently 87 members um, and 10 brewery and planning members. Um, we can do better, and I know a lot of you get my emails. If you don't, please let me know. Um, whenever we go to Albany, um, you know, the governor just put out uh, a lot of money, and whenever we go to Albany, and they, one of the first questions they usually ask is, how many breweries uh, do you count? And I tell them, and they say, well, how many of those are members? Because it matters. Uh, it really matters for, from a unified, um, uh, from a, being a unified force uh, in Albany. So uh, with that said, that's where we are, 154 breweries, 87 members. I would love to get 154 members, but uh, I'm not sure if that's possible. But, but if you haven't joined uh, and you'd like to join, um, please come see me uh, afterwards, and I'll, I'll show you how. It's real easy. Um, today, um, we've got a couple speakers. Um, we're, we're very happy to have Bart Watson here, who is the staff economist for the Brewers Association. Uh, Bart's going to give a, a presentation about New York State by the numbers. Uh, and then, of course, uh, David Katleski, who is our, our co-founder and um, board president, uh, will also um, be talking about um, what's happening with the association. So with that said, uh, I'd like to uh, introduce Mark Watson. Uh, Mark, you want to take it away? Great. Uh, thanks, Paul. Uh, maybe I can project. Um, thanks, Paul. Uh, thanks, Nat and Bill, for supporting getting me out here. Um, my name is Bart Watson. I'm the staff economist at the Brewers Association. Um, got to meet many of you yesterday. Super glad to be here. Um, my email address, uh, which I always hesitate to give out to rooms like this, uh, but it's Bart, B A R T, at breweriesassociation.org. So if you've got follow up questions, don't get a chance to chat with me. Um, if you want to talk numbers, uh, should be a note. Um, today I just want to talk briefly kind of about craft nationally, where we are, uh, situate that in comparison with New York, give some New York specific numbers, um, extrapolate. Uh, talk about where we might go just a little bit. It's always kind of fun. Um, and then close with just some trends that I'm seeing that I think it's worth having a, a room like this to be aware of. Um, so national numbers, um, craft now, about 8% share, 7.8%. We have in 2013 nationally. Um, that's after 18% volume growth in 2013. So industry is blowing up all over the place. You guys beat that. I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. Um, about 14% dollar share. That's retail sales value. Um, craft, we estimate, is now worth $14.3 billion at retail in the U.S. Um, so we're not talking chump change anymore. Uh, of that, um, I guess brewer revenue at about $5 billion. So um, craft brewing, it's you know, small businesses, but collectively it is now big business in the country. Um, and it, it is very important uh, also in terms of economic impact, jobs created. Uh, 110,000 jobs directly at breweries and brew pubs in the country, we estimate. Um, given that there's probably been two that have opened since this meeting started, that's probably luck. Um, but it's growing every year. You guys are job creators. It's, it's something to be, be super proud of. Um, comparing that with New York, um, New York, uh, I estimate, grew at 19% this year. So you guys are beating the national average. Um, I'll talk a little bit about why I think that is in a second. 
Um, very vibrant industry. Um, New York added about 140,000 barrels of crack last year uh, compared to the year before um, versus about 2.3 million nationally. Um, that plays in with craft, uh, New York's percentage of overall craft. About 6% of the breweries in the country are in New York. Um, after comparing notes with Paul, I estimate there are about 165 craft breweries in New York. Um, but you know, all, every brewery number now should have a star because there's so many opening every day. Very hard to keep track of um, you know, whether they're actually breweries or not. Uh, people are starting to like slapping that brewery name on even when they're um, not a brewer, which is a, a little bit troublesome. Um, but 165 breweries, that's about 6% nationally, um, and that barrel change is about 6% of the barrel change, too. So um, New York is moving proportionally up along with its industry. Um, I have this cool map that I'll, I'll send Paul the slides um, so, so he has them, and you can put them on the new website when it, when it comes out. Um, but seeing a map of New York in 2008 versus 2013 is just amazing. The number of breweries, the spaces are filled in. Um, if the density around the cities is incredible. Um, there are breweries opening literally every day in the country. It's about 1.2 nationally a day open. So, so literally on average, we will get a brewery opening today. Um, and we will have all, two and a half uh, over the course of the weekend, uh, which is kind of insane. Um, where does New York fall relative to other states? Uh, when you look at the absolute numbers, um, New York is a leader. Um, so we talked about the 165 breweries. Uh, we estimate about 100... Yeah, or excuse me, 860,000 barrels in 2013, <coughs> total that New York produced. Uh, that's all craft brewers together, um, including barrels that, that go out of, out of state as contract, but that were made here. Um, we don't have NAB in our numbers, so if you, if you throw them in, that's going to go up a lot. Um, we'll, we'll change that figure a little bit. Um, so proportional, you know, absolute terms, New York's in the top ten in everything. Um, you know, top five in, in, in barrels produced. Um, a little bit lower in breweries because some of the, the western states have a little bit more density. Uh, we're over 200 in Colorado, uh, over 200 in Oregon. Um, so absolute terms, and California just has so many, it's incredible. Um, but absolute terms, New York's a leader. When you start looking at per capita, uh, New York drops down the list. And this is where you know it seems like the people who have been around since that 2008 map <coughs> probably think, how can we have more breweries, how can we have more growth? But in per capita terms, New York's actually pretty middle of the pack. Um, Hover over my dot here so I get the numbers right. Um, New York breweries produce um, about um, what is it? 4.1 gallons for every 21 plus adult in the state. Um, that's a little bit above the national average, but the leaders are at 12 or 13. Um, so there's clearly a lot of room for craft growth when you look at the New York industry relative to other states. Um, you know, Colorado, Oregon, Vermont are all in double digits in terms of gallons produced per 21 plus adult. Um, number of breweries, New York's at about one. So there's about one brewery for every 100,000 plus, or 100,000 21 plus um, adult, um, adults. Um, leading states are at six. Um, so again, a lot of room for growth when you start looking at it in per capita terms, which is kind of insane. Um, so I said I was going to do a little bit of fun with extrapolation. Um, if you take the average of Colorado and Oregon, which you know aren't small states, you can, you can kind of cherry pick Vermont and make everyone seem like there should be a million breweries. Um, but if we look at the average of, of Oregon and Colorado, given New York's population, if New York looked like those states, there would be 777 breweries. Yeah, there now um, will be. So the next time somebody asks, all those welfare cases are not buying craft. We're not close. Um, you know, especially if they're small, if they're focused on small towns, local neighborhoods, the state can take more breweries. Obviously, we want those to be high-quality breweries. We want them to find their niche and be differentiating. Uh, but there's plenty of room to grow. Similarly, uh, any guesses on how many barrels New York would produce if it looked like? Oregon and Colorado. We're at 860,000 now. Two, two mil. We got two mil from the 2.5. Can I hear higher? Five million barrels. If New York is producing per capita, like Oregon and Colorado, five million barrels of craft production. Um, pretty amazing. So again, there's room for growth. It's, it, you know, anyone who's been around five, ten years, it seems like how could it grow anymore? Um, but compared to some of the states that are at the top of the curve. Um, there's definitely still room for growth in the state. Whether we'll get to 5 million barrels is a, is a separate question. Um, so some trends. Um, I'm sure you guys already know this nationally. Um, you know, the big trend this year was IPAs, IPAs, IPAs. Um, you know, there was all the jokes in the brewing industry and media profits ahead. You know, well, well, pick, your, pick your favorite acronym. Um, but, but IPAs continue to be on an incredible tear. 40% growth in, in scan data last year in terms of both volume and dollar sales. Um, and if anything, the early scan data from 2014 is faster. Uh, so the nation can't get enough of the IPA trend. One thing that's 
kind of counterbalancing that. It's interesting to see at the same time as this rise of session beers uh, nationally. It's hard to see because the scan companies have never really had session as a category, but when we start to cherry pick some examples, um, it's pretty clear that the craft consumer is really <coughs> maturing. Um, and so it's not all about high ABV, you know, what's new, what's different, um, but that we are seeing session, kind of different beers for different occasions. Um, the growth, I'm starting to really see shift to the off-premise. Um, so for many years, craft was driven by on-premise growth. Bars, restaurants, getting those tap handles. Um, not like that's not growing anymore, but that's growing a lot slower than it has in the past, and it's growing slower relative to off-premise. Um, so, so far, in the first three months of 2014, um, craft is up 21% by volume, 24% in dollar sales in off-premise. Um, pretty freaking amazing. Um, and that's very different in the past where typically on-premise has been the thing that's driving the growth. Um, that's going to create some challenges. Um, big retailers, they only want to deal at a certain scale. Um, and we're already seeing some challenges around craft, you know, getting into the large-scale chains. Um, there are some interesting developments going on in things like C-stores, which are starting to suddenly realize that craft exists and they can make money off it. Um, but that's going to be something that everyone should be aware of going forward, that growth in tap handles is probably, we're starting to see number, average number of tap handles, which was growing for years, starting to slow down. Um, so that growth in the future is probably going to be driven by that off-premise. Um, we're still seeing breweries opening and planning. Um, we count over 1,800 breweries and planning in the country right now. Um, don't know how many of those are in New York. Um, New York seems like it's slowing down a little bit uh, relative to some other places, especially the southeast right now. It's just starting to blow up with plenty of breweries. People, are, people also in the southeast are realizing that craft beer exists. Um, but that's it's something that's still coming. You know, it seems like there's a lot of breweries now that I'm <coughs> sure is more, fuller than it ever has been. Um, expect it to be more full for the next couple of years. Um, closings are going to start. I'm, I'm going to say that now. Um, there's a great, almost perfect correlation between openings and closings that lags three or four years. So if we're getting 400 brewery openings a year um, right now, three or four years from now, we're going to see you know 50 to 100 of those breweries close. Um, doesn't mean a bubble is burst. just means that there's market competition and people are going to go out of business. It's something that you, know, you should prepare your minds for because uh, the press is going to have a field day with it because they don't really understand economics very well. <laughs> All right. Um, craft beer is everywhere. I, I pulled out my Hemisphere magazine, which, you know, United, get on the train. I don't have craft beer yet. But many of the airlines are adding craft beer. They have a, a lovely article about three days in the Finger Lakes, which a couple of years ago would have only talked about wine. There's a brewery in here. So, you know, we're starting to get to places where craft beer is everywhere. You can find it at restaurants. People are pairing beer with food. Um, craft beer is becoming part of the national consciousness. Um, and, and but thanks to you guys. So nice work there. Um, so a few New York specific um, data points um, that I just got because uh, somebody was nice enough to send me them. Um, the beer business, unlike nationally where beer was down um, last year, uh, beer is up in New York. Um, I think craft brewing coming online is, is a big part of that. Well, it was up about 2%. Um, IRI estimates it at about a little over 400 million in New York food stores. So that's again that, that off-premise piece um, in the last year. Um, and the big guys are down. The top three in, in those scan data lost 1.4 share last year. Um, most of that is getting taken up by craft. So we're seeing similar trends in that off-premise channel um, than we've seen uh, elsewhere, where um, you know Bud, Bud Light, Miller Coors are just are, are losing share like crazy. Um, something to be aware of that at a certain point, I mean, ABI uh, executives are really starting to talk about how um, they're not willing to trade share losses for profit anymore. Um, so expect some changes in the pipeline in coming years. I don't know how many of you followed the story in Washington um, that Shock Top and what was the other one? Um, it was Black Crown suddenly got slashed through ABI distributors to 55 bucks a keg. Um, so there's going to be some, some pushback. The big brewers are starting to realize they're losing a lot of share and they're changing their business strategies accordingly. I don't know why it took them 10 years, um, but they're, they're going to start playing, uh, playing a little rougher. Concerns on the horizon. So I've mostly been giving good news so far. There are plenty of concerns. Right now, Kraft, 8% um, share, uh, uses between 40 and 50% of the hops in the country. Start extrapolating that outward to 20% share, which I think is eminently doable for Kraft. And you're talking more hops used just by Kraft than are currently produced in the US. So raw materials are going to be a challenge. We heard from the farm brewers how you know, tough it's been to get you know, New York-specific hops and get that information. Um, that's going to be a challenge for everybody going forward. The hop growers are aware of it. Contracting helps. Um, but, but some of these raw materials are going to be more difficult to get in the future. Distribution is going to be more of a challenge. Trucks are getting crowded. 
Shelves are getting crowded. Taps are getting crowded. Um, we're going to see, I think, new channels open up, new distributors opening. We talked to a, a new distributor who's here today uh, who's, who's at Tap New York that's doing craft beers because they see tremendous opportunity. But that's going to happen slower than the growth. And so there are going to be more and more fights for those distribution channels. Um, quality, I don't know how many people were at CBC. Um, I won't repeat Paul Gatz's, uh, Paul Gatz's speech on it. Um, but quality is a concern, too. Uh, you know, how many people, and this isn't just from brewers, it's throughout the system. <coughs> All sorts of places where the first time somebody picks up a craft beer, they need it to be the best beer possible to keep them in that category. Um, I have down regulation as well as a challenge. New York is, is a state that by far has had one of the better regulatory environments for craft. Um, the vast majority of things, you came up with, you know, ten regulatory things you want. Um, you know, craft has eight or nine of them here. Um, hopefully we're going to get uh, TAPS, uh, make micro licenses ability to sell uh, pints at the tap room uh, soon, which would, you know, move it even closer to that 10 out of 10. But there are always challenges lurking. We're seeing, wholes seeing wholesalers start to push back um, on a lot of uh, franchise reform legislation. Um, and there can be kind of hidden things. The Supreme Court um, had a case recently where they upheld the right for police on anonymous tips to pull over people uh, suspected of drunk driving. Uh, send a chill down the spine of anybody who sells most of their beer on premise. Yep. Um, so there can be kind of unexpected regulatory things. Uh, one reason you're all here, I'm sure, is to support the um, New York State Brewers Association um, and fight against those things. But just because the environment has become favorable doesn't mean it can't get pushed back. So I think that's a big concern. Um, I'll stop there because I think I'm well over my 10 minutes. So I take questions if anybody has questions. Great. Well, the, uh, <coughs> question on... Um, the data, the scan data. Mm -hmm. So IRI, Nielsen, they're taking scan from grocery yeah. that channel. How are uh, how is on-premise? So on-premise data sucks. Um, <laughs> that's a technical term. Um, there, so there are some firms that do it. Guest Metrics is the leading firm at the moment. There's another firm, Restaurant Sciences, whose data is you know I I, I don't like speak ill of people who are trying to put data out there, but I think they had craft down like 6% in on-premise last year or something, you know, I mean, just, it's completely implausible. Um, the on-premise data is not great. Everybody knows it. It's based mostly on national chain restaurants, which are not heavy craft users. They completely miss brew pubs. They completely miss micro tap rooms. Um, some of the companies are working to improve it. Um, so IRI just took a equity stake in guest metrics, and in theory is going to pump a lot of money in there. Um, at the VA, we're actually working on this. We're talking with VIP, we're talking with IRI, we're trying to figure out ways we can measure it better and, and get that to members, because especially as you move to off-premise, that IRI data is gold when you're talking to uh, retail chain buyers. Um, but it's, it's not great, um, and, and hopefully we can make it better. Uh, but the, you know, the proliferation of places that are outside that scan data environment is just going up. I mean, the, the gap this year between our number of growth, which I have 100% confidence in. I mean, we, you know, we got reporting from the vast majority uh, of the barrels in the country, and the, and the data that other groups were putting out because they were basing it on that scan data was huge. I mean, a lot of people were reporting 14% growth, and we were at 18. Um, and that gap's only going to go up as, as, until that on-premise data gets better. So it's there, but it's not very good. You can't get on-premise data from TTV where we all report it? TT, well, so I mean, TTV, TTV is impossible to get data from. The only thing they will ever tell you is how many licenses there are in the country. They won't tell you who holds them. They won't tell you know. They, I mean, they include people too who have been out of business for five years in that. Um, we file a Freedom of Information Act request every year and try to change it up, and they always say no, sensitive tax information. Uh, the best place to get it for a lot of the states is via the state. Um, you know, a number of the states have great data um, that they have very specific. You know, here's what this brewery sold in this state. Um, but not every state does that, and so compiling a national picture, um, I, I'd have to look, re look and see what New York provides in terms of that. But you know, I mean, some of the big craft states have great data. Oregon, you can you can see what every brew pub in Oregon produces every year, down to the I think they do it to the hundredth of a barrel. Um, so that's the best place, you know, when you're when you're when you're looking for that kind of data, is look to the states. Uh, of the craft beer you were saying was sold in New York State, how much of that is from New York producers? That's a great question. Um, Nationally, we see it run 65 to 70%. Um, in New York, I guess it's a little bit lower. Um, I know in the scan data, um, good friends at Boston Beer do very well in the state. Um, my guess is it's, it's probably you know more like a third or half. 
Um, but I'd have to, I can recrunch that too, actually. I, I need to come up with new estimates for that. But um, nationally, it's probably higher than that. 60 or 70% of beer in states is, is, is from those states. Uh, new York's probably a little bit lower, given where it is on the curve, and that you have some neighbors nearby that are producing a lot of beer. Or, I, I guess it's like a third. Third, yeah. That information would be helpful because I think as we're, we're promoting New York State as a brand to our wholesalers and retailers, you know, to drink local, drink New York, drink New York, buy local is a great bumper sticker, but we're really trying to push that if we can use that as a number and a goal. I'll send, I'll, I'll crunch those numbers and send them to Paul. Especially if it's a show we really want to promote because we all know New York is not supporting I always say if, if New York if New York could be like Vermonters, we totally would. The news is they're going to turn Vermont into New York before we turn New York into Vermont. Any other questions for Bart? Thank you. Very much. Thank you. Yeah. Sure, everybody knows David Kantleski, president of the New York State Brewers Association, also the co-founder. Were we 11, 12 years ago? Like 2003? 2003. 2003. I think there are maybe 38 breweries at that time uh, hmm. in New York State. So uh, the growth has been phenomenal. It's been, uh, it's been great. It's been a, you know certainly a learning learning curve along the way. You know, and I, I kind of want to dovetail off of what uh, Fred said for a minute because I think this is a, a key important factor. Um, in order for us to grow in terms of um, uh, market percentage in New York State, we have to get the retailers and the buyers on board. Uh, and I think that is uh, pretty much the number one objective of the New York State Brewers Association. And the way to do that is to get the state behind us. Uh, this is the most open administration that I've ever dealt with in 20 years uh, of dealing with uh, Albany. They're listening to us, finally. But we've got uh, a, a great governor uh, in terms of um, wanting our businesses to grow. I'm not sure how other businesses view him, but in terms of beer, we have a very beer-friendly governor and administration. Uh, we have to take advantage of that while we have it. So every opportunity that we have to get the voice of Albany, uh, we will. For the first time ever, we have access to funds, which uh, wine industry has really uh, been uh, taking advantage of uh, over the number of years, or much better structured, et cetera. So, you know, when, when, uh, when, when we decided to go after this farm brewery legislation, which was uh, important, it was more from a greed perspective. Uh, we, on the association uh, board uh, level, saw this as an opportunity to uh, grow beer like wine grew in New York State. Uh, the idea of a, of a wine uh, farm license started in 76. It was enacted in the early 80s when there were 35 farm, when the 35 wineries in New York State. Uh, oddly enough, Mario Cuomo uh, jumped on the wine bag band wagon and uh, enacted this legislation. So there's now over 350 wineries in New York State. At one point, they were funding <coughs> $3 million a year to grow their industry. Um, uh, Andrew Cuomo is looking at beer similar to what Mario did with wine. So we have to jump on that beer bandwagon with them. Uh, there's opportunities for uh, uh, funding our growth, uh, and we're going to try to take advantage of them wherever possible. Um, the, uh, you know, you, you look at past accomplishments, and I, I don't want to spend a lot of time on that because it's the past, but we're the first state not the only state to pass a franchise law in, in, in New York, which allows small breweries an opportunity to, uh, to leave their wholesaler. It's a huge, huge deal. Um, the farm brewery legislation, which I mentioned, uh, there's a uh, brand lab label registration, relief from the actual fee, the costs associated with the BLR, uh, and also um, a production tax credit, which was huge. Uh, that uh, kind of all kind of tied together at one point. So we've made tremendous strides over the years. Uh, and now there's a very unique opportunity to, uh, to grow even further. The, uh, the State Liquor Authority is our friend. I can't believe I'm saying that. <laughs> <laughs> but they are, uh, I have Chairman uh, Dennis.
Dennis Rosen calling my cell phone and asking me questions about what the Brewers need. I've got uh, Chief Counsel Tom Donahue also putting me on conference calls talking about what the breweries need. Um, and they have a lot of ideas because they're getting a lot of outside pressure as well from you. Anytime you have a question, you call the State Liquor Authority, which is great. Um, the uh, the, the uh, state also put, put together this one-stop shop and appointed this gentleman named Sam Filler, who unfortunately couldn't be here today. Uh, Sam, we have access to. When I say we, all of us can call Sam at any time and ask him a question. And he's now the liaison between uh, between us and all of the uh, the size of Albany, so, or the size of uh, the administration. So he can find the answers for us. And I will tell you that it may take him a half a day to get back to you via email or even a day, but he will, and he'll get you the answers. He's an amazing resource for us. We have to take advantage of that. Um, you know, I think uh, the Taste New York program that the governor has enacted, it was his idea, and now he's putting it forward, is a huge opportunity for us to get out there and get our product on shelves across uh, New York State, as well as a lot of these small Taste New York events where, if nothing else, the media <coughs> shows up and then starts to promote your, promote your brand. Uh, Bart raised a very good point, because I have to tell you, I was, I'm nervous about the amount of growth, especially when 35 new farm breweries open up in the last eight months. That scares me. But then when you look at the statistics, there is room for growth. I think the whole key now is having quality product. Because just because your friend, this is, this is something that uh, uh, the beer talks about all the time, Paul Gatz in particular, just because your, your friend thinks your beer tastes great doesn't necessarily mean it tastes great. <laughs> so we want to make sure that we share information. <coughs> we use uh, pro brewer websites and the forum to communicate and talk about how to make better beer because we want to make sure that what's in the glass is a good representation of New York State um, and that we can continue to grow in, in that vein. All right, so uh, about 18 months ago, there was a beer, wine, distilled spirit, and cider summit. It was actually, uh, cider wasn't invited to the table initially. Uh, <laughs> they were brought to the table uh, towards the tail end, which in my opinion is a good thing uh, because I'd like to say that cider is now taking the place of beer as the ugly stepchild in the, uh, in the, in the manufacturing. So um, the, the nice thing is, is that we all sat around at a table and talked about opportunities. You know, how, how do we grow? Where, where can the state help us in terms of legislation or even uh, without legislation, simple, uh, simple changes in the, the, the general rules uh, in New York State? We had a follow-up meeting that was last Tuesday. Uh, instead of going to the Craft Brewers Conference, I went and I spoke on a panel uh, on behalf of the New York State Brewers. And there were a number of asks that, uh, uh, and I believe that I had covered all of them, although I'm finding out that I may have missed a couple, and, and those have come to me, and I've then uh, transferred those over to, uh, to the state for consideration. But there is sweeping reform going on right now in our licensing. It's 122 pages of uh, law reform. And essentially what it's doing is it's taking, it's trying to create a level playing field between those four manufacturers. Uh, and distributors are involved uh, in that as well, but I don't need to uh, digress to that. Uh, essentially what the, uh, the legislation does is it, um, it um, consolidates a lot of the licenses that are out there now. So what you will see, and in, 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 instead of sending the information out and really creating uh, a lot of questions. I think the state knows what they need to do. They're going to propose something. It's uh, proposed legislation. They're going to try to get that in uh, this session, which may end in the next four or five weeks. So we don't have a lot of time. Uh, I think the legislation will be proposed by the end of this week. And uh, so far, what I've seen is, uh, is very good. The uh, one particular area that I wanted to uh, add to this legislation is the farm breweries. Uh, I'm concerned that the uh, that there's not enough product out there to meet the needs of the farm brewery li license. And what happens to the small farm brewery when they can't get to 20% of uh, locally grown uh, ingredients? The, they agreed to have a separate behind door, closed doors meetings to talk about this, but I think ultimately, What's going to happen is they may lessen uh, the enforcement of it. Don't quote me on that, but I think uh, that ultimately may be what happens, because they recognize there's, an in that there's a concern. 
a concern with the amount of hops that are available. So it's a There's lot, certainly but a concern not with the really amount of barley. Now, one positive thing that came out of this uh, summit is that the state has issued a $350,000 grant to Cornell to do a study on barley. And uh, Cornell, and I'm also on a commission to bring barley back to New York to, to create malt barley uh, business in your state. Uh, Cornell asked for 750000 They believe that they could get the research that they need um, with 350000 But what they're indicating is that this industry, the barley industry, is not going to be even nearly approaching mature for another 10 years. We need to turn out that as our percentages go up. Uh, so we're looking at certain things. There is a, there's a piece of, uh, in Rich, I, I kind of wanted to talk to you about this, but I noticed that in the uh, cidery, uh, legislation, you have to use New York State um, apples uh, as long as they're available. And it sure would be nice to have something like that in the farm brewery legislation, as long as it's available. And it's nothing against the farmers. Larry, we want to use New York State products. We do. Um, hmm. more, you know, nothing more than that, because I think it does, you know, as, as Tim says, it's overused, but there's a certain terroir that uh, the, the New York State uh, ingredients uh, have. And I think it's, it's critical that we, uh, as farm breweries and breweries in general, have access to, to these ingredients. So we want to work directly with Mark James at the Farm Bureau and get these uh, farmers to grow these products and also make it cost effective. I mean, They're not going to do it by like, giving the brewers so an So when you look at ingredients, as we mentioned in the farm uh, meeting, you know, certainly um, availability, quality, and cost. All right, those are the things, you know. It's one thing that uh, uh, they're available. The other thing is the quality has to be there, and, and, and it has to be affordable. Uh, believe, it, uh, believe it or not, brewery margins are very slim. And when you are paying, are used to paying a dollar for uh, a pound of barley, and all of a sudden it goes up to three dollars, it, it, it destroys our margins. So somehow we have to be competitive with growing <coughs> barley, and I think that's where the state needs to help us. Uh, so we're working towards that. Um, one really nice thing, and I know there's a lot of microbreweries out there that would like to sell uh, a pint of beer at their uh, at their tasting rooms, that is part of this bill. Now, the, the caveat is initially the, uh, the SLA was saying, well, we want them to have a restaurant license, and my argument is, I know a lot of breweries, they should not be operating restaurants. And so then they said, tavern, and I said, well, there's no real definition of tavern. This past Thursday, Tom Donahue contacted me with an email, and they uh, they are e lowering it from tavern to finger foods, and they're not defining finger foods. So you know, my feeling is a bowl of peanuts is finger food. You know, when you eliminate the need for utensils and napkins and service, um, then I think we have you know we have a shot of fulfilling you know the requirements of finger foods as it relates to uh, selling the beer. And ultimately, what this is going to do is create more revenue for the state, and it's going to create more sales for the brewery. So I think it's a win-win-win situation across the board. Just on that, if, if that passes in June, it's not going to happen for six months. Is that right? Typically, there's a grace period. Um, I think I, with all laws, there's a, there's a waiting period afterwards, and maybe six months. Um, let me find that out to verify that. I mean, that might be. I mean, Ray has said we're going to get it, but yeah. the six months is a little bit of a bummer. I don't know why, but let me, uh, let me find out. I think most legislation usually is first of the, the new year. Yeah, right. All, everything well, kind of it, And I've starts. also heard first of the new year or when the licenses have to be renewed. So, like, okay. for us, our license doesn't renew until May, so that means we have to wait until the end. How often do you have to renew your license? I think you're in there. You, you can have language in the law, though, that makes it the new right. This new, no, this new consolidated uh, uh, license allows for three years. So anybody that's producing, and, and, uh, and I have no idea why I didn't ask for this, but they're raising the definition of a uh, craft brewer and a farm brewer to 75,000 barrels annually from 60. And, uh, and I think that was just to kind of parallel some of the levels that they're raising for distilleries, and they're just trying to keeping a uh, level playing field all together. Um, so above 75,000 barrels, your your three-year $950 fee, which is what it, what, what it will be proposed for anything south of 75,000, north of that is 12,000, so it's a $4,000 per year for the, for the license. 
the nice thing is, is it's a three-year term. Uh, now, adding, adding on to that, they're going to allow you to uh, uh, self-distribute. They're going to allow you to also ship beer in state, which is currently against the law. Uh, according to, and you have to be below the 75,000, unfortunately. Um, and it's only up to 36 cases a year, so we're not talking about a major internet business here. Um, so, uh, but the, you know, there is some flexibility there. The marketing permit is now built in, so you don't have to apply for a separate marketing permit, which is nice. Um, and you, you can also sell glasses of beer at events. So if you're participating in an event, you could actually sell a glass of beer as part of this. So there's a lot of win-win situations here. Uh, I don't know about the glasses. Terms of, in terms of the, uh, the summit, that, that pretty much uh, sums it up in, in, as for changes that uh, uh, are going to be enacted into the law. Once I have a final uh, piece of legislation that will be sent in, and it's nice when you have, there's, there's one thing when the New York State Brewers Association has a bill, uh, and we, uh, you know, we, we, we put it in and we get the, the support from both uh, sides, from both the Senate and uh, the Assembly, and then we, we put it in, uh, and then we kind of fight for it. There's another thing when the governor puts in a bill. Because when the governor puts in a bill, the thing goes through. It just goes through. And this is a governor's bill that they're putting in. So I think it's going to be a, a, a good economic benefit uh, for all of us. Yeah. Um, you know, one of the things that um, we are very fortunate to have uh, for the first time is Paul Leone. Paulie's been doing a, a great job uh, for the association. He's only been with us since, since July. Uh, we lobbied hard to uh, raise the funds to bring Paul on board. Uh, we have always operated on a shoestring budget uh, because, frankly, we didn't need a lot of money in the past. But as we are growing, uh, and I will tell you 10 years ago, there were 10 of us in a room like this. Uh, as we are growing, we need uh, an executive director because this is a full-time job. It totally is. And, and I was getting totally burnt out by it and I was, I, was, I was not doing a great job because somebody needs to focus all of their attention on this. So Paul has been brought on and a key group of uh, breweries in New York State kind of pulled their money together and, and we, uh, we decided to all throw in anywhere between five and $15,000 to refund the association because we were kind of desperate. We didn't have a festival that we could rely on, uh, have a fallback position to, uh, to be our funding stream, and, uh, and we needed to act quickly. So uh, a bunch of breweries came together, threw some money together, and uh, brought Paul on board, and, and it's now, Paul is now uh, working on this, this New York uh, beer festival campaign that's gonna allow us to have an income generator, among other things. Um, but I would encourage you, I'm going to send everybody a letter um, that I, I'm going to ask for one more capital campaign. If anybody can contribute, whether it be $5 or $50,000 to the cause, I highly recommend it. This is a one-time deal. Uh, we're not going to dip back in the well. If this is just uh, kind of spearheading money to really take this organization to the next level, which is what we need to do. Uh, Paul finally has somebody... Uh, someone's here in Albany, so we're able to get some of these funds that they're allocating to us for marketing purposes, uh, but we need more seed money. So uh, I'm going to send out an email. If you guys can contribute, great. If you can't, uh, I understand um, and completely uh, uh, know how difficult it is to just cop up money for, um, for, for any other reason other than to invest in your business, but consider this an investment in your business because you should know that although we do a pretty poor job of sending out newsletters, that's going to change. Um, we, uh, we are working on behalf of the New York City Breweries every day. I field call 
calls, Paul Peel's calls, every day. So um, you know, there, there are people that are trying to, 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 get, to keep your back. We also have a lobbyist uh, that we, we pay. We also have a lobbyist who, with, who you have access to. Uh, so if you ever have any legal questions, you need an attorney, he's a former senator, uh, and he's been our lobbyist now for, I think, three years, right? Yeah, and David, just one way that you might rationalize giving is that you all have a New York State production tax credit. And, you know, yeah, that money's a bonus for us, but you all got it back after losing the tax benefit. So you take the production tax credit, we're all getting, and, you know, it's a gift. Take some of that gift and... It's not a gift, dude. It's your freaking money to start with. I think the membership should rise on this. And if anybody ever has any questions about where that money's going, um, please call me. You know, my cell phone's on, on my signature. Uh, call me anytime. Uh, 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 we we'll tax you 100%. We'll drop it to 80 until you get in the favor. Early on was we have now oh, a budget and we have a, you know, a marketing plan. All of these things exist now. Um, so if you ever have any questions, please call me. Membership is huge too. I mean, we, you know, we're looking at 87 members versus 154 breweries. We need those fees to help subsidize this. I mean, this is this is money going to work, and it's worth joining. So, anybody who's not a member, please join other breweries that you know that are, are wondering what's in it for me. This is what's in it for you. And we have some of the lowest membership fees in the country. Um, uh, I know that I was talking to the California Guild, and, and they charge by the barrel, and it's 10 or 15 cents. Um, you know, so I think they said Sierra Nevada, you know, pays them forty thousand dollars or more. They're doing it that way. We're two hundred and forty-five dollars and four hundred and ninety-five dollars. So, and, and again, membership counts. Two questions: How many breweries? How many members? These are really, really important questions. So, and it's surprising to find out how many people think they're members and they're not. Mm -hmm. um, you may just want to verify that you're, <laughs> you're a member. Uh, so. In, in addition to all the state stuff that the New York State Brewers Association uh, does, you should also realize that we help on a federal uh, side. Uh, each year we go to march on federal excise tax uh, reform uh, to Washington, D.C. We meet with uh, uh, <coughs> House representatives and senators and we talk to them about our needs. One of the huge uh, topics right now is the FDA regulations on spec grain to grow to farmers. It's a huge, huge issue. And it's not done yet. Even though uh, Senator Schumer did a press release in Albany the other day and said it's dead, it's not dead. It's still alive. There are going to be some regulations, uh, and it's going to be that the regulations are going to be less if you uh, take your spent grain sell and sell it for uh, less than half a million dollars a year in total revenue, but you're still going to have to fill out forms. There is still going to be some type of regulation. It's not going to be as as astringent as they initially came out, because what they said is they wanted all the grains dried, they wanted the nutritional value uh, done, they wanted packaged, and then stickers for nutritional value has to be put on it. So, you know, with you know, the, it, that would be an impossibility in terms of uh, economic cost uh, to us. And then uh, the FDA recognized that all the spent grain can't go into landfills, so they backed off on it. The BA has been amazing. Uh, I think <coughs> from all over the United States just kind of really made their, their, their voices heard on this pitchfork issue. And I think it's going to be relieved uh, significantly, but there's going to be some type of, do you know anything further on? They're going to issue uh, another ruling in the summer, um, which we've been assured in. We have calls. Paul Gatz, our director, does calls with the FDA once a week now. Um, so it's actually been very good building that relationship. And they assure us that it's going to be non-onerous on small breweries. Um, that said, there will be another ruling in the summer. Um, if it's non-favorable, um, there will be another comment period, and um, the BA will be reaching out again to get comments. Um, we'll start. It shows the work that um, both state and, and the BA, the state guilds and the BA have done the last couple of years, that um, when this <coughs> came up as an issue, it came up very quickly, and you know, we called <coughs> our friends on the Hill in Washington, and they heard us and, and reacted. So, um, you know, talking earlier about you know, what Paul does in building relationships. Sometimes those things don't seem like they pay off in the short run, um, and then something like this comes up, and it's good to have friends in, in capitals, so. Dave, from, from our point of view, we're still going to continue to push to have the whole thing go away, though, awesome. so. Thanks, Mark. And uh, if, if you're not a member of the Farm Bureau, uh, I think you should be. In fact, if I were, you know, as, as a small brewery myself, I think it's important to be a member of the, small, the Farm Brewery, Farm Bureau, sorry, 
um, Neha. Uh, there's going to be a new Farley Association, which probably won't be expensive, but you'll have access to their information, uh, and the Brewers Association. You know, collectively, it's probably 500 bucks a year. Yes, yeah. But, yeah. but you have access to everything now uh, across the state. And there are huge benefits and huge uh, payback for being a Farm Brewery member, Farm Bureau member. What is the membership cost? Normally 75 a year. We're running this special right now for 99 for the rest of this year and all the next. So, if you and one of the big things I found out with with the brewers is you buy a lot from Granger, and um, we have a we have a deal with Granger where you get free shipping on internet orders and a 10 percent minimum discount. So, um, just just that alone. Of course, we work closely with with Dave and the brewers and Paul and the Brewers Association as well. And um, Dave and and Paul and a few others, um, Dan Mitchell um, have written most of our policy as an organization on on the craft beverage industry. So, and they support uh, breweries um, uh, in Albany every time that they're they're lobbying as well. So thank you for that. Mm -hmm. uh, at this point, I'll open it to any questions that you may have before we turn over. Uh, to uh, to Steve Miller to talk about the current state of hops in New York State. Yes, sir. Uh, two questions. Uh, the name for the state lobbyist again, please. Ray, Ray Meyer. Thank you. Uh, secondly, uh, the pending legislation does that affect uh, a microbrewery's ability to uh, sell the pints in our tasting room? Is this you will be able to sell your pints in the tasting room, provided that you <laughs> offer finger foods. But that's still six months out. If it goes that's six months out. <laughs> Well, it's not illegal if you were to take a, uh, an on-premise license, but the on-premise license would have to be tied directly to a, a restaurant operation. So this uh, will now automatically be included in your um, license, and it will last for three years, which is nice. So it will be all inclusive. It's consolidating all of these licenses into one, which is nice. Um, maybe a follow-up answer is that, that ability for a microbrewery to sell by the pint um, kind of negates one of the biggest benefits of the farm brewery um, food. So you think they'll kind of take the pressure off farm breweries that we've seen so many of? In terms of New York State labeled beer? Well, one of the big, for me, the biggest benefit of the farm brewery license was the ability to sell pints in my tasting room. Right. And I know many, many other of the mm -hmm. 30 got that license just so they could sell pints <laughs> in the tasting room. But if any microbrewery can, there's no reason now to get the farm brewery license. You just get the microbrewery license. Dun, dun, dun. Or the microbrewery license or whatever. This board is probably the most active board, uh, I think, in the history um, of this organization. And, you know, we have conference calls. We have board conference calls the <coughs> first Tuesday of every month. And I think, you know, maybe for the exception of one or two, every board member is on that call. Um, and, and that's really, that says a lot. You know, they, they, we're very, very active. Getting things done. So moving on, uh, we're very fortunate to have Steve Miller, who is the Cornell hops, uh, Cornell University hop, hops expert. We go to Steve when we have questions. Uh, Steve has uh, a lot of uh, a lot of information that I think all of you are really interested in about what's going on in the industry right now. Uh, so Steve, I might need a microphone. I'm not sure. Thank you. Can everybody hear me? Okay. Good. Um, it's interesting uh, to see the growth in the uh, number of breweries because we've also, with hops, we've seen the same thing. Four years ago, there was only 15 acres in the state, and as of this summer, we'll have about 250 acres. And uh, four or five years ago, it was people putting in maybe 100, 200 plants, half an acre. Now we have people putting in 5, 10, 20 acres at a time. So the industry is really maturing that way. Um, we've... Uh, I'm funded, I work for Cornell Cooperative Extension, and I'm funded through grants that we write through USDA and New York Farm Viability Institute, which Farm Bureau really supports us there. And, um, and then we also have some money coming from this uh, funding that David uh, mentioned earlier for hops and barley. That, most of that 350000 is is going to barley. There's a little bit going to the Geneva Experiment Station Hop Yard. And I also wrote a grant uh, last year that uh, we funded to um, hire a scout to work with the hop growers all over the state. 
And so I'm in the process of hiring somebody right now who will be going to hop farms scouting for insects and diseases. Um, I also have a project that we've been doing quality testing and uh, leaf petiole analysis so that we know what the growers are doing as far as fertility because our yields are less here than what they are in Oregon and mm -hmm. Washington. Uh, half or less. Mm -hmm. And we know we can do a lot better than that. So um, I expect the yields to be coming up to more like 1,200 pounds an acre uh, or more in some cases. Uh, obviously, that depends on variety, too, but the funding that we have for leaf petiole testing is giving us a lot of information so that we know people are putting on the right micronutrients, the right uh, amount of nitrogen, and, and then we did quality testing, too. And last year, that was done through uh, Hop Union. They did, uh, we didn't pay for it, but they gave us a discount on that. We did quite a few samples. And that scout that I'll be hiring will be doing some of that uh, collection of uh, of leaves and uh, also collection of the uh, hops for doing the quality analysis again. Um, we reported on that at our conference each year and uh, this year in Morrisville we had 360 people attend that conference and they come from all over the Northeast but most of those people were from New York and we've got over a hundred growers now um, most of which have uh, more than an acre and as I said some as much as uh, 20 acres. Um, two fingers. Two fingers? No, we'll slide up two fingers. Oh, okay. All right. Um, oh, there's uh, there's some somebody buying hops today. Yeah. <laughs> um, so the other thing I want to mention uh, is that um, By the way, this uh, this report Dave's going to email to everybody. So, uh, whether you want it or not, <laughs> um, we've got uh, variety trials at the Geneva Experiment Station. Uh, about 30 varieties there now, and uh, another trial out at the Lake Erie uh, Grape Lab. And then I've got a variety trial over at Brewery Omegong as well, and they've been very supportive of the whole hop program. And, um, we've even got some new varieties coming from out of the country and from out west. So you'll see that there'll be a lot more varieties available from growers in New York. We, we started a, a clean plant program three years ago, and what that involves is we buy uh, virus-free, disease-free stock from the clean plant lab out in Washington State, and then we propagate those in New York, and there's two or three grower, greenhouse growers now who are doing that. And uh, we've got about 30 to 40 acres a year that are being planted strictly with that clean stock. And the reason that's important is because any of you that are interested in planting hops, keep in mind that when you buy rhizomes from out west, you're also buying stuff that's been dug up out of the ground. And there's no guarantee that you don't have downy mildew, powdery mildew, or viruses coming with, that, with those rhizomes. So it's really important if you're starting a new yard to, uh, to put in clean stock. Um, also wanted to mention Morrisville College got a fairly large grant uh, this last year for $650,000 and they're putting in a pilot brewery, a pilot malt house, and uh, going to be doing some hop testing there. And then at the Geneva Experiment Station, uh, and they're also including it in their curriculum, and I'm teaching a, a course there. The Geneva Experiment Station is also getting some money from the state to do some uh, brewing analysis. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with Carl Siebert. Uh, that lab has been, is being uh, upgraded, and uh, they're going to be doing uh, brew analysis for people as well as hop analysis. So that will be available soon, too. Just recently, I went to Poland, and we bought uh, four more wolf harvesters. So we now will have eight wolf harvesters in the state. And uh, just to, for those of you who are not growing hops, if you, if you don't have a harvester, you really can't handpick them and make any money. Uh, these harvesters can, uh, can pick about 170 to 200 vines in an hour versus uh, somebody handpicking doing one vine per hour. So it, it really makes a big difference, and uh, we're getting drying equipment, uh, some tillage equipment, and uh, baling. Uh, 
so that that'll make it a lot more um, these harvesters a lot more available to growers all over the world. Um, the the other thing I want to mention too is we have uh, four businesses in the state that are pelleting and packaging. Uh, Whipple Brothers out in Rochester uh, has got large scale equipment and they're doing it. Uh, they're just west of Rochester. Um, Hager Hops down, right down here in Oneonta is is uh, putting in pelleting equipment and they did some pelleting last year. They have a warehouse and they'll be uh, processing and packaging for people. And then uh, Foothill Hops in Munsville, they do small scale pelleting and I think um, Rick Peterson over in Seneca Castle does some small scale pelleting too. So the reason I'm mentioning that is that people are saying they want pellets. We have four companies now that have the capacity to pellet 10, ten times the amount of hops grown in the state. So if you need pellets, just let the grower know that that's what you want and they can get it done. Um, I know we're running late, so I, 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 one last thing I did want to mention is I know there's a lot of talk about barley and uh, uh, Dave mentioned that funding for some research. They're going to be doing variety trials around the state. The biggest problem with growing barley in the east is uh, Fusarium head blight, which is a, a fungus. Um, they get it out west, but they have less problems because they grow in a really dry climate. Uh, we, we can grow barley here. It's been grown here for a long time, but malt barley is a, a specialized variety and a specialized crop. Um, so that research is, was started last year and will be expanded this year, and I think you'll see a lot more uh, barley varieties available and specific information on how to grow six row versus two row and fall planting versus spring planting. And uh, as of this year, I think there's going to be about 3,000 acres of barley in the state that will go towards malting, assuming that it, it will meet the quality. Uh, and that's really important. Secondly, along that, we've got six new malt houses starting up in the state, two of which are already functioning. <coughs> Um, and then, of course, people have been uh, getting some malt uh, from out at Valley Malt in, uh, in Massachusetts as well. Um, planning a trip to Czech Republic and Germany next summer. Not this summer, but next uh, probably July or August. So you might want to watch for that. Uh, we'll be going to hop yards and breweries in Germany and Czechoslovakia. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. It was supposed to be for this summer. It just uh, it got it got beyond uh, the amount of work that was going to require. So, anybody have any quick questions? Uh, I'd be glad to try to answer them. Yeah. Where can we find out information on some of these more resources you're talking about? So, um, I didn't put it in this. Uh, email here, but I'll, I'll send it on to Dave. Bill Verbeaton, who is the person who's heading this up in the uh, Cornell Grain end of it, uh, some other names you'll see are Mark Sorrells and Gary Bergstrom. Uh, Bill has got developed a website that you can actually click on it. You can see all the malt houses, you can see all the uh, malt growers, and, um, and then his research plots. And if you just Google uh, uh, Bill Verbeaten, B-E-R-B-E-T-E-N, Malt, I think you'll find his website. Okay, thank you. Yeah. The uh, contact information for the clean uh, rhizomes, do you have that as well, like as far as buying clean plants? Yep, so the question was contact information for getting plants. Uh, we're almost all, pretty much all sold out. We, we start the taking orders in December, but... Um, if you go to the Northeast Hop Alliance website, and don't go to neha.org, but you need to go to Northeast Hop Alliance, uh, org website. I have my newsletter there. We have all kinds of information on, uh, on getting the plants. Uh, you, can, you can contact me directly if you want. And we still are, we've got about 14 varieties, and next year we'll have about 21 varieties. And if you need Steve's info or after this meeting, you can also contact me and I'll, I'll forward it to you. <coughs> Anybody else? All right. One thing I wanted to mention that I neglected to, and the state asked me uh, last week. Uh, the state ha is, is, is putting together funds uh, accessible by breweries. It's through the JDA program. Now, some of you may have remembered the old G G G 
JDA program, which was not successful. Uh, I think the new one looks uh, fairly good, based on what I'm what I'm reading. Uh, they have 180 million dollars of low interest loans available to us. Uh, now there's a caveat: you have to have bank participation up to 50 percent. You have to have 10 percent of your own, and then they will cover the other 40 percent. They take a second lien position versus a first lien position. So. Uh, JDA information is available. I'll give it to Paul, uh, the guy that I'm dealing with. He's been appointed to, uh, as well as staffers, uh, to, to make this happen. Uh, so we'll get the information to you because there are uh, there there are some additional funds available out there. All right. And startup construction, which is unique because not a lot of funding sources for startups. Uh, I want to introduce uh, Chris Erickson, who uh, is our treasurer. Um, he'll give you a treasury report on bank balance. Thank you, Thank you very much. much. By the way. Thank you.